My name is Lisa Herzog. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Um, prior to that, I worked I was trained at the Field Museum. I've been in, in uh, preparation for <coughs> close to 20 years now. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to continue this conversation we're having with uh, integrating all the competencies but focusing on the ones that I was tasked to talk about. Um, I think that what Matt and Matt have already outlined for us here, you know, it's all interrelated and, you know, they touched on some of the topics in uh, under these uh, categories, three, four, and five. Um, in listed uh, in the competencies, um, the biological materials comes before geological materials. Um, I'm going to talk about it. First, I'm going to talk about geologic materials because, you know, historically speaking, uh, paleontology is really a sub-discipline of geology, and traditionally, paleontology programs have been in ge geology departments. Um, if you think of a traditional narrative, and I think we've all seen um, diagrams like this in learning about paleontology and if you've gone through any kind of geology program. Um, there's been, there was developed a narrative that fossils are composed of minerals that replace the original biological materials. Um, and then you can have trace fossils, which are also made up of rock in Earth, um, which fits nicely into the geological car uh, category, um, but it can miss out a lot of stuff, a lot of information and data. Um, so, if you look at this diagram, we have um, an animal dies, and apparently there's nobody else around, just the animal. It gets buried, there's always got to be water around in order for it to fossilize. Um, it gets buried, it sits there for millions of years, and then it becomes exposed and somebody goes and collects it. Um, and traditionally, that's what, you know, if you imagine early museums where it would they mounted specimens and it would be the animal itself standing there. Um, a, a perfect example of this model is uh, Petrified Forest National Park where you have a forest of trees that um, all the biological material has been replaced with mineral. And so it fits the narrative of the geologic um, model. However, um, more recent uh, research, and I think that we're, we have <clears throat> transformed that concept because of research and things that have been discovered, so that we look at it more holistically and consider um, the biological parts of things. And you know, now we know that um, you know sometimes things are completely mineralized, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's partial biological material left. Um, you have things that are permanently mineralized, you have different types of fossils other than an animal that died and went through that whole process. Um, and one other thing that's really important and critical in looking at um, fossils as geologic materials is considering the concept of deep time. Um, so sediments accumulate in layers and it gives you a relative uh, time, relative record of time um, with modern technology and radiocarbon dating, all that kind of stuff. We have more precise measures, uh, you know, actually putting dates and numbers on things. Um, and as a preparer or as somebody that works with collections, you need to be aware of the time concept and have some reference as to, you know, where your specimens are from because it is completely related and tied into the evolutionary process. So, you know, if you're working on things from the Mesozoic, you know, it's going to be different than if you're working on things from the Triassic. And so it's a really important um, aspect of understanding the geologic aspects of the specimen. Um, we also have um, things like the matrix that your specimen is surrounded in. Matt touched on this a little bit. Um, and so something like this, which is really big, and you can see it's a, it's a petrified sand dune, um, which gives you a key to the ecology of uh, the, if you have any 
fossils in that area. You know, you're going to be able to tell um, a little bit more about the animal than just the structure of the bone when you uncover it. Um, which, in turn, um, can create an entire picture of the ecology um, of the, the past. Um, I know that you've probably all seen many different pictures like this that tries to capture every single animal that we're in the time period in one picture, um, which seems a little bit unreasonable, but you know, at the same time, it kind of helps put things into perspective. Um, and it also highlights that no animals live in isolation. Um, and so if you're, you know, if you go head to a museum and see just one thing um, standing in isolation, you know, making these reconstructions um, brings it back into context that it's an entire ecosystem that we're interested in learning about and studying and, you know, figuring out the evolution of, of, of life on Earth. Um, which kind of leads me into understanding fossils as biological materials, um, because these animals were once living and they're part of the biologic sphere. Um, just to go back a little bit, um, you know, here's, I, I did a really quick Google search and, you know, it came up with a lot of different uh, little drawings of the same fossilization story that's been told time and again. Um, but a more modern and integrative diagram of the fossilization, fossilization process kind of shows the, the process as it should be. It's, it's a dynamic um, process that has different pathways and different things can happen to an animal after it dies. So you start with uh, your, the biosphere. You know, that's where the animals live. They die, you know, from whatever cause. They could have been killed. They could have died from natural causes. Um, and then each point where you have this little mesh is it's a filter. So at that point, that's when you start losing data. Um, the, the animal then so under, starts going on, undergoing diagenesis. So it starts decomposing and different things can happen to it at that stage. Um, you have not, you know, not only is it, it possible that an animal was um, prey and is going to be torn apart by another animal eating it, but also um, there's a lot of micro things that go on with the, the decay process that can also cause an animal to spread out. So modern taxonomic studies show that um, just the action of insects and bugs can completely disperse a skeleton over time. Um, and so if, if something sits on the surface for a while, you can have things spread out because of that, and that's part of the reason why we don't get a lot of complete specimens, or well, we get very few. Um, and the concept of something being immediately buried, and that's the only way to become a fossil, is, is a little bit of a myth. You know, things can sit on the surface for a long time. And I know, I'm sure that everybody in here has dealt with specimens that, um, you prepare part of it, or you prepare it, and you look at it, and you think, man, it looks like crap. And But you realize that it's because it probably sat on the surface for a while before it became fossilized. It wasn't part of the geologic um, fossilization process. Yeah, um, it was just because it didn't get fossilized right away. And so you can get fossils that were in the desert, stuff like that. Um, things become buried. Um, and we have evidence in the fossil record that things become unburied um, because of erosion of the sediments that they're in, and then they get reburied. And um, it's important to, to try and note that kind of stuff when you're recording your data, um, what, what the rock surrounding your specimen is like and what the specimen itself is like, because um, there are instances of things appearing to be much younger than they actually are because they got reworked. Um, and, you know, this is the state where it enters the lithosphere, and that's, you know, when it becomes part of the geologic record. Um, and then, of course, we lose data even more when it becomes a paleontological sample, um, and we do our best to make a reconstruction of what that animal is like. Um, so, 
to summarize uh, this complete diagram in respect to um, the original simplistic geologic um, perspective, um, it acknowledges um, biological influences on preservation. So anything that can happen after the animal after it dies, or to the animal after it dies. Um, there's multiple sources of data loss. You can have data loss in a lot of different areas, and in that sense, it's kind of not surprising that the fossil record is the way it is. That I mean, you rarely get complete specimens. Um, and it's a two-way system that affects your time interpretations if you look at this, the burial and the unburial, um, that talks about, that covers the possibility of fossil movement after burial. Um, and all this kind of ties into the, the theory of the modern synthesis and the beginning of a discipline called paleobiology, and that kind of happened during the mid-century, like 1940s, you started having researchers um, collaborating with biologists and, you know, trying to get a bigger, a better holistic look at evolution as a whole. Um, and if we bring it back to our, our competencies, and how all this fits in, because you know, if you look at it now, we're in the 21st century, um, where we have, you know, a lot of paleontology departments aren't in the geology department anymore, it's in the biology department. And um, that's one of the most important things about the preparator exercising good judgment when interpreting the distinction between biological remains and matrix. So it's not just about, um, having a specimen that's in matrix, you take the matrix off and there's your specimen. There's a lot of other things that can be in the matrix and surrounding it and stuff like that. And there's a nice picture right now. Um, thank you, internet, you know. So. <laughs> but I think this is a really good example of how, you know, this is something that is pretty standard in prep labs now, in the way that we prepare fossils. And even if it's something that you're working on that's large, is that, Every lab should be working under a microscope, you know, because even if you're working on something big, there's a lot of stuff that could be in there that you're just not seeing. Um, like Matt described how he found that tiny little tooth in the Orient on jacket. Um, oh, was that jacket? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think that that's part of using good ju judgment is just to make the decision to get microscopes and use them in your labs so that you're magnifying everything, you can see if you're damaging things, you can see the minute details. And you know, you might you might be able to see uh, biological stuff that you didn't see, other things that are preserved. Um, we know that there's a lot of other things besides just brush in fossils. Um, and here's an example of that. Of course this isn't something that you can see under a microscope, but you know, there's a lot of new research coming out that's showing that there are still biologic structures preserved in fossils. Um, this is from Mary Schweitzer's work um, looking at actual bone cells. Um, I don't scale one, but, uh, so that data is there. The, the fossils aren't just completely mineralized. Um, and we have to be aware of that kind of stuff. Um, and then moving on to the vertebrate anatomy and physiology and evolution, um, it's good to know about anatomy because you'll know what to expect as you're moving through your specimen. Um, the physiology of, of an animal will help you determine what the functions of structures are. And evolution in time, it goes back to that whole idea that if you know what age your rocks are, you're going to have an idea of what might be in there or what should be in there. Um, of course, you know, vertebrate anatomy is a term, their vertebrates is something that covers a lot of different animals. I mean, you think of something humongous like a titanosaur, and you think of something tiny like the pica that you found um, at. And, you know, the nice thing about it is that the body plan of all animals is fairly similar. Of course, the microstructure is going to be different, but 
you know, you can be fairly certain that your animal had some kind of head. Um, you know, of course you never find the head. Uh, <laughs> skulls are rarely observed, but you know, you know it should be there. Um, you know that it has ribs, and of course not all animals have tails, but you know, the different parts of the backbone have different structures, the different types of vertebra, um, limb bones, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's, you gotta know the basic structure of a vertebrate. Um, the preparator can recognize that fossil specimens are the physical representations of primary paleontological data. Um, so the, this kind of goes back to talking about the you as a, as a preparator, you as a technician, or you as somebody who's handling the specimen. Um, you know, the specimen is not something that's finite. Um, it's up to interpretation as to how it gets prepared and how you're, 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 what you're removing. You know, every time you handle a specimen, you're changing the data associated with that specimen. Um, and here's just an example of, you know, you have bone, but there's also some <coughs> preservation. There's also, you know, we see other things that get preserved besides just bone. Um, you know, there's a lot more feathered animals coming out nowadays and stuff like that. Um, and that's all part of the specimen, it's all part of the data, um, it's all part of the biology of that animal. Um, and some of the stuff might not be right next to the bone. So if you're going through a jacket and you know where the bone is or you kind of have an idea of how it's laid out, you might be surprised when you come across some skin that's sitting six inches out, um, and a lot of people might miss it because they're not expecting it. Or, you know, people aren't familiar with skin preservation or have never seen it before, um, but it's there, it's in the rock. It's, it might be separate feathers, um, other skin impressions, things like that, tendons, you know, it's, it's all part of the specimen, but it's not all gonna be right compounded with the actual bones themselves. Um, and so once, you know, I think that three and four lead into number five very well, um, because once you have, you know, the, the, the first four skills in your, in your wheelhouse, so to speak, um, you know, then you're ready to participate in the science of paleontology. So it's about, um, being able to be conversant, vocabulary, terminology, um, and the research goals too. So each individual lab, each individual researcher, paleontologist has different agendas as to what they're looking for. Um, and it's up to you as a fossil preparator to be able to participate in that. Um, and, you know, look up the scientific references you need to look up. Um, looking at it, here's how I see what's, what happens in a lot of labs, and I think that in some ways it's kind of changing, um, but as far as participating in the science of paleontology goes, um, we need to do a better job of making it common knowledge and accepted that the specimens, the preparation, the field collecting, everything is part of paleontology. It's part of the specimen, it's part of the research, it's part of the data. Um, so we have, um, it's pretty common now for museums to have public labs like this. And so we up, up here, this is the Tate Museum at the Love Ray Tarpets, there's a the Field Museum, Terrell Museum. You know, we have these labs where people can watch us do our work. You know, it's really cool. Let's see the fossils, let's see the specimens. Um, but what people see in those labs is the preparators working. They're working diligently away at removing the rock. And it's, it's very much separated from the paleontological research process and the paleontologists. Um, because it's commonly not, you know, it's, the way paleontology and paleontologists are represented is that, you know, the specimens are done. You, you get, you put some 
last toe on there, and then he does some research. And you know, this is the stuff that gets publicized, right? You know, the nice little picture of him looking at the skull, and doing some measurements here. Um, and, you know, things are set up to, to be uh, photographic and stuff like that. Um, but it doesn't really encompass the entire process of what has gone into making something like this. I mean, we know what went into making this because we know that nothing like that comes out of the ground. And some of these are probably sculpted or cast because when you ever find a good specimen like that. Um, but it's important for us to try and participate in the science and make it, you know, converse with your you know, whoever you're working for, the researchers, sometimes it's you that's doing the research, but, you know, think of it as a holistic thing, but the entire process um, is one thing called paleontology. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the North Carolina Museum, because that's where I work right now. It's a little bit different concept. It's, um, the, this building here was built um, and opened in 2012, and SVP was there in 2012, some of you probably were there. Um, and it was based on this concept of having research labs that are visible to the public. Uh, so the, the building has five research labs um, that have glass walls, and you can see into them, you can see the research going on. Um, in the sense of paleontology, it wasn't super novel of an idea because a lot of labs have preparation, uh, public preparation labs. Um, other labs that are in the same building are, uh, there's a biodiversity lab, there's a genomics lab where people can actually see, like people doing DNA studies and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's an astronomy lab, which turns out is kind of boring because all these people look at computers all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're having a really hard time trying to figure out how to read that lab uh, but. The thing that's novel and unique about this, about our lab, is that it's not just a preparation lab. Um, as it says here on the, the label, it's a research lab. The, we do preparation in here, but with the research is always also being done in here. And so here's a floor diagram of the inside of the lab. Um, you know, so this is all preparation space, but it's also research space. The, you know, we have mobile tables. So that we can set up different things, whether we're doing preparation or if somebody needs to analyze specimens. Um, down here, you have offices. This office is the, the head paleontologist at the lab. She's in there every day. She does her work in her office. She comes out. She measures things. She works with me directly. My office is here. She prepared her office. Um, we have a histology lab right here where we do all our histologic processing. Um, and then over here, we have these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. We turn this into cubicle space. So we actually have graduate students in there as well, and a couple of postdocs. Um, and so what this, this kind of changes the narrative, you know, when you're incorporating the paleontologist in with the space. Um, it makes it a lot more concrete to visualize paleontology as a holistic uh, discipline with the research, the specimen preparation going on in here, um, and the, the, the ability for me to just go talk to Lindsay whenever I need to, um, or if I'm working on a specimen and I think something's really cool, or I want to know how far she needs to prep something, or you know if something's normal or abnormal. Um, and, and, you know, in a lot of institutions, you may have that ability to go to the person that you're working for, or collaborate, but there's, the spaces are separated. Um, and I definitely notice that there's a lot more collegiality, there's a lot more collaboration. It seems more like a unified unit by having it all in one space. Um, and so I think that that's a really good highlight as to you know how we can participate in in the science of paleontology by you know even if you don't physically have a space like this to mentally envision that it's all one science and that we need to um, collaborate more and consider ourselves all one unit. Um, in summary, <laughs> uh, I was. I was trying to figure out how to summarize this talk, you know, <laughs> you know, put them all together and stuff like that. And 
<laughs> I was doing Google searches with images and stuff like that, and this came up, and it, it just made me think, um, you know, if you understand fossils as biological materials, as geologic materials, and you're able to participate in the science of paleontology, something like this is going to be easy for you. So, I'm not doing this, but, you know, when, at, whenever a paleontology movie comes out like this, you know, Jurassic World, um, you're, all your friends and family are like, oh, what you think Jurassic World? The science of that. I'm like, science, science. <laughs> um, but, you know, even as much as I don't always like to talk about it, you know, I try to put it in perspective so people do get a better picture of what paleontology actually is and why this is entertainment and, um, you know, what it's based on paleontology and biology. You know, you have the concept of making chimeras and biologically doing things based on things that were found in the fossil record. Um, but it's not reality. Um, but if you can, you know, I think that it's good to talk about it in that sense because people get a better idea of paleontology in general. So geology plus biology is paleontology and you should all talk about it.